Good evening. I think this is as American as you can get, and I'm going to ask everyone to please, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I want to 
thank the people from Action Together in Long Island, Julia Fenster. Is she here? Is Julia Fenster here? Yes, she is. Who here is from Action Together in Long Island? Raise your hand. Very good. Very good. Who here is from Long Island Activists? Okay, Ron. Is Ron here? Ron Whitlick? I don't see him. I would recognize him. But couldn't make it. Who here is from, okay, we've got four indivisible groups. Who here is from Queens Indivisible? Raise your hand. Very good, you're not from Queens, excellent. Who here is from, oh, that's uh, Doreen DiLeonardo and Peter Tufello. Are either one of them here? Here's Peter right there, Doreen over there. Oh, that's Doreen. You, some of you raised your hands and you were Doreen. You're not Doreen. <laughs> you're Doreen. I saw your picture from the thing the other day. And who, and North Shore Indivisible, Jamie Lazar. And Glenn Cove Indivisible. Very good. Is Maria Venuto here, by the way? I'm meeting with her on Saturday, I think. And how about Huntington Indivisible? Very excellent. Karen, is Karen Harlan here? Thank you, Karen. You didn't know I knew your name, was Karen? Okay. So, are there any other groups that are here? Which group are you? Oh, you're with the Reach Out America. Let's hear it from Reach Out America. Who else is from Reach Out America here? What's that? MoveOn.org. Who's from MoveOn.org? Raise your hand. Who else? Yes, in the back. What is it called? And then we're going to go through each subject, and people want to talk about those subjects 
We'll talk about those one subject at a time and then move on to the next one, okay? So the first subject that people have brought up to me over and over again, of course, is we have to save the Affordable Care Act. And we cannot do we cannot do is repeal and replace. So I'll talk about that some more in a second, okay? The second issue has to do with this unusual relationship between the President of the United States of America and who? It's something very, very important. The third thing is the travel ban that we think is really based upon a discriminatory modus operandi. And the fourth is the immigration deportation that's just starting to kick off now. I'm very passionate about this. Patrick Young, by the way, Pat Young from today? Pat Young from Croatian today? No. Okay, and the fifth issue, which I, it's really where I've received the most phone calls about, but I can't, I don't know if it's going to be the big topic for tonight, but it's something I've received so many phone calls about, is all this stuff going on with the environment. Okay, so very, very big issue for me. I was the New York State League of Conservation Voters Environmentalist of the Year for all of New York State for stuff like this. is very important to me, the environmental issue. I've been receiving tremendous calls uh, and, and letters and emails. I've received over 12,000 contacts so far since I've been in office. I've been requested to go to 1,000 meetings and events. So it's just it's so much coming at us all the time. But I don't know if we're going to get to all five of those tonight. Now, I'm sure there's going to be other issues. What was the question? You left something out. Okay. She wants to add, add the conflict of interest of the president, which we're going to put down with the Putin thing, okay? You can volume this book. It's okay. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 So, yes, very, very important issue. Very important issue. Very good tie into the program. Very important issue. And choice, you know, I have 100% rating from Ben Harrington, just so you know. So, uh, we're going to put that up in the back. All right, so let me just tell you that regarding the Affordable Care Act, we held a rally. Early, one of the first things that we did was a rally with myself and Congresswoman Rice. And we had 1,500 people at the Yes We Can Center. And we had people actually get up and testify about how a repeal of the Affordable Care Act would actually impact their personal lives. And it really is a matter of life and death for a lot of families in America. And it's, there's 20 million people, here's a million of 20 million people, there's 20 million people that received health insurance that didn't have health insurance before. But it's not just those 20 million people, as, as huge as that is. But there's another group of people that have pre-existing conditions. So they had health insurance before, but if they, if they have some sort of sickness or calamity in their life that they're facing, if they want to try and move to another job under the old law, before the Affordable Care Act, they couldn't get new health insurance because they had a pre-existing condition. And that same group of people who have health insurance outside of the Affordable Care Act are people that had lifetime caps. They have these serious health issues and the insurance companies would say, we're going to cap you at this much money that you can ever get insurance. There's lots of people with very serious issues that they face that uh, would be affected by if those caps were to be put back in place. This whole thing with kids being staying on their parents' plans until they're 26 years old, people have changed their whole lives around that provision. And there's the gender discrimination, where women were actually charged more than men for health insurance, uh, which just doesn't make any sense based upon their gender. And so there's there are 20 million people, there's these other people that have health insurance that would be devastated by this. And the third thing is all the economic impacts that are related to this. There are hospitals, there are workers, there are providers, there are so many people that have changed their whole lives based upon the Affordable Care Act. This would affect everybody's health insurance in America. Now I said during my campaign, as did I'm sure most, many Republicans and Democrats, that there are problems with the Affordable Care Act. There's no question about that. I always said we have to amend it, don't end it. The Democrats, really under the tutelage of Chuck Schumer, have said, listen, we're not going to propose the democratic fix to this. You've been complaining about this for the past X number of years, Republicans. You've got to propose your fix. And we're starting to see their fix come out in drips and drabs. And you know what? Now it's time for us to start challenging what they're proposing because it's going to pay for the tax you up, because we lose the opportunity to make more expensive for people. And that's a political strategy. Much of our natural inclination is 
hey, let's all work together. You know, I'm, I'm the first guy to say I want to be bipartisan and I want to try and work across party lines and try and solve problems. I'm in a thing called the Problem Solvers Caucus, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I want to work across party lines. I want to work with people. But as a political strategy, the suggestion is, is that what we should be doing right now is seeing what the Republicans have to propose and then trying to see what they, they say that makes sense and what doesn't make sense. So that's what we're starting to see happen right now. So that's the affordable care. We'll, we'll talk about that as the first issue. People can ask anything they want to ask about that. Next is uh, the president, President Trump and Putin. The intelligence briefings that I've received that are confidential, but just the public information that's out there is that the Russians definitely did engage in an effort to try and influence this election. There's no question that that happened. And we see other connections that keep on enhancing this. Tied into this is what this young woman brought up over here, is the emoluments clause. It's strange that a person who has the great honor of being the President of the United States of America, a great, tremendous honor and responsibility, is not divesting themselves, or at least putting a blind trust their financial interests. Why is this happening? I've heard lots of people saying things like, well, you know, it's his money, he made his money, he's not going to get rid of all, he's not going to sell all of his assets, he's not going to do this. It's, you know, it's understandable, you know, he doesn't need the money. Well, what happens, which has happened, when the kingdom of Bahrain, the kingdom of Bahrain has a party scheduled at the Ritz Carlton. They cancel their party at the Ritz Carlton and they hold it at the Trump Hotel. What happens when elected uh, 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 foreign dignitaries come and use the Trump facilities to for all their events? And there's you know hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. Who knows what the numbers are? Because we don't have his tax return. What are the numbers that foreign governments are spending at these facilities, or permits that they're giving, or help that they're giving with these international properties? So we don't know. I'm sorry. Okay. So, so the idea is we need to know what's really happening here because this was set up in the original Constitution of the United States of America, the Emoluments Clause, and it was something that George Washington specifically talked about, that the leader of the United States of America cannot receive payments from foreign governments because, God forbid, that would ever influence the decision-making of the President of the United States of America. So the whole Putin connection and the emoluments clause, they're not necessarily one and the same, but they're kind of related with this conflict. Now listen, I don't know, I don't know, you know someone wrote a thing on my face, I had a meeting, a great meeting the other day with, um, uh, was it Indivisible? It was Indivisible at my office. And I, someone wrote a, a Facebook post, everyone said, it was a great meeting, he said a lot of good stuff, but he didn't show enough outrage, okay? I've been doing this a long time. If I was outraged, every time I needed to be outraged, I'd be exhausted and leave it <laughs> So we don't know the answers to these things, but we're, I'm going to keep on pushing and fighting to get the answers to these things so we can hold them to play the The third issue is related. There's nothing wrong with outrage. No, there's nothing wrong with outrage. I just don't have enough in me. I'd be exhausted. You can, you can be outraged. Anybody wants to be outraged, show it right now. Say, I'm outraged! <laughs> so the, the third thing, the third issue, the third issue is related to the travel ban, okay? This is not only makes us less safe, it's less us. It's not who we are. It's not who the United States of America is. There are perceived to be a number, say, 80,000 people who are involved in terrorist, terrorist organizations throughout the world. 80,000 people involved in terrorist organizations. I'm reading a great book right now called Thank You for Being Late by Tom Friedman. I recommend it to everybody. It's a great description of what's going on in the world. And he talks about how in the old days it was the Soviets versus America. The Soviets versus America. And when that happened, the Soviets of the United States of America propped up a lot of average and sub-average governments that wouldn't make it otherwise because they were either incompetent or they were corrupt or they didn't have the resources or whatever it may be. Well, that doesn't exist anymore with the Soviets in America. And a lot of these sub-average and below-average governments are failing. And, and the battle is 
but not between this ideology versus that ideology. It's a battle between control, places that are in control, versus chaos. There's a lot of chaos in the world right now. There are 65 million refugees in the world today, people that have lost their homes, people that have fled the place that they live, where their families are. They have fled 65 million people because of climate change, because of civil war, because of terrorism. So what's happening in a lot of places in the world is climate change causes people to have droughts. You know, Syria, the whole thing in Syria with this civil war is going on in Syria, it's sort of droughts. And people flee their farmland, and they go into the major cities, and they get to the major cities, and they can't find a place to work, and they find some other people who can't find anybody to work, and they go look to the government for help, the government won't help, they say, we're gonna go after the government. Or they'll flee from their home, they say, I'm gonna leave Nigeria, and I'm gonna go to the promised land of Libya. You know, Libya's the promised land, this way they're just gonna kill each other in Libya. And they get there, and the terrorists will say to them, hey, do you wanna make some money? Come with us, we'll go blow this stuff up, we'll go steal from the good. So what's happening is, is we are trying to create this idea that it's a whole population of people that are against us, which is not true at all. There are people that have been misplaced that are being recruited by a, a complete adulteration of their religion. So this travel ban is very, very dangerous, yes? Yeah, but let me, let me just finish and then you can ask the question. Let me just, I'll call on you first. So, so that's very dangerous. It, it, it's not us, and it's not safe to do that. It's very related to what's going on with the immigration stuff in this country right now. This has been a big issue since I was the mayor of Lincoln. My first speech I gave when I was inaugurated in January of 1994 was about immigrants, the new immigrants, the undocumented persons uh, that were coming to Glen Cove at the time. And I said, when looking at a difficult, because we had two sets of people, we had one set of people saying, get those people out of here. We had another set of people saying these poor guys are trying to live the American dream, they're trying to you know, do what your father did. My father was a, uh, born in Italy, came to the United States as a young boy. So I said, when looking at difficult questions like this, we have to look at the basic American principles. America's founded on two very fundamental principles. Number one is all men and women are created equal. It's not all men and women with a green card are created equal, or all men and women with a passport are created equal. All men and women are created equal, and everybody is entitled to be treated with human respect and dignity. And this issue cannot become an excuse for racism or discrimination. It also makes us less safe, because when we start making everybody scared, the 11 million people that are undocumented, when they're scared, and they can't trust their local police force, ICE, as county executive, I stopped the Nassau County Police Force from working with ICE because you cannot have. The... Now listen, I want to make it very clear. If, if there's a criminal, if somebody's been convicted of a crime, get them out of our country. I'm 100 percent for doing that. But it can't be that you know you, you, we're going to deport people for their, a driving infraction. The problem exists is that if you're an undocumented person and you get mugged. Say you're walking home with cash in your pocket, you get mugged, but you can't go to the police for protection. Where do you get protection? Well, if you're saying you get mugged by a gang, gang says, oh, we won't mug you anymore, just join the gang. That's how you get gangs. But people go for protection when they're living in an underground community instead of going to the local police force. You can never have the police, local police force be in a position where the the population is scared of the police. It will not work. Not, I was a mayor with my own police force in Glen Cove. I was the county executive with the county executive police force. It never works when the population, same thing that, that went on in the country with all the discrimination of African Americans and the violence, it cannot, does not work when the public does not trust the police force. That's what community policing is based on. And we've been very vigilant about fighting against this idea of mass deportation. It's so dangerous, it's so bad for our country, I can't emphasize it enough. So the fifth issue is the environment. I'm not going to go into talking about that now. People can ask questions about that. Let me just tell you that I've got such a good record on the environment, from closing the incinerator in Glen Cove, to cleaning up two federal superfund sites, to hazardous waste sites, to stopping nitrogen from going to the Long Island Sound, from building wetlands, to preserving the hundreds of acres of open space. I got all kinds of stuff, I'm not gonna do it. All right, so let's start with the Affordable Care Act. Oh no, here, you get to ask the first question. It's not one of your five topics, but it's relevant to exactly what you were saying. Okay. 
Let me do the, let me do the five copies. Is it okay to get a place? Hey, man, it's a tough question. Can you feel it? I can feel tough questions. I'm used to taking them, but I would do it in, in the, the structure we have. I know, yeah, do the first question. Go ahead. Who's got the microphones? Thank you. Peter, can we get over to him? Here's the microphone. Tell me you that there's 65 million refugees across the world. Yes. The United States has a part in that community on terrorists. You're part, you're part of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. There is a Stop Arming Terrorist Act, H.R. 608, bill introduced by Tulsi Gabbard. Tulsi Gabbard, yeah. Tulsi Gabbard. Uh, it has bipartisan co-sponsorship. My understanding is that, and I had this wrong, I'm new to all of this. Yeah, okay. You are not co-sponsoring. Are you going to co-sponsor and support the Stop Arming Terrorists Act? And if I, not, why wouldn't you? Yeah, I haven't decided yet. Because Tulsi, Ga Tulsi Gabbard is a Iraqi veteran. I think she's an Iraqi veteran. And she went to Syria on her own. Actually upset some people that she went on her own. She was highly criticized for it. But I met with her. Uh, I met with her and got a briefing from her about her meeting. And uh, she has a lot of good things to say. And I've just got to research it further. I don't have an answer for that yet. I don't why not? Why not? Because I've got so much stuff coming over the transom that I haven't read the bill and I don't know the details. I don't want to take up time. I just want to say, how could we ever? Or how is there any? If it was as simple as that, I, I would, it would be easy for me to answer the question. I haven't read the bill. So yet. you won't commit to not having it. Okay, thank you, Peter. So, Peter, you just asked the exact same question on Friday, okay? I didn't read it from that Friday thing today. Uh, okay, all right. So let me just say very clearly, though. It's true that America funded Osama bin Laden to fight the Russians in Afghanistan back in the 80s. And America funded Saddam Hussein to be our strongman in the Middle East when we lost the Shah of Iran. And we, and Syria, as we, not just the, the rebels in Syria, but before that we funded the king. And we're still close to the Saudis even though the Saudis are promoting Wahhabism, which has killed the Jewish people and killed the Americans. So we have a long history, history of doing this. So why did we do this? We did this because we wanted to have access to oil and region. We have, for the first time in 50 years, the opportunity to not be as dependent on the oil of the Middle East and the historic And there's an opportunity which is not going to be seized, I don't think, by this administration, but there's an opportunity for the first time in 50 years for us to say to the Middle East, we understand that people don't trust us because we've manipulated the region for the past 50 years, and we want to build some trust with you. And we never wanted your land, we don't want your money, and now we don't need your oil. But we need to start moving in the direction of more clean energy in this country to become more energy independent, and we'll never be relying on that oil in the future. And you can bring the microphones over to the people there's, there's more than one microphone, isn't there? Okay, so she's got one. You go get another one, Jay. Let's let's bring the microphones to the people. Okay, this gentleman right here. Okay. I can talk without the mic. You want everybody to hear you? Right behind you, sir. Tell us your name. And a, uh, let me just say. Let me just say two things. We're waiting. Okay. What time is it now? Okay, it's seven thirty-eight. I'm going to give everybody a choice. Okay. Do you want to go to eight thirty? 9.15 or 9.30? Oh, all those in favor of 8, 8.30, 8.30, 8.30, raise your hand. All those in favor of 9.15, raise your hand. All those in favor of 9.30, raise your hand. All those who want to stay all night long, as long as you Okay. And I also want to thank the JCC. I want people to know, here have been all night long. And the JCC folks did not tell me this, but I read about it elsewhere. There have been over 50 bomb threats in JCCs throughout America over the past few months. So let's give these folks a big round of applause. And thank them for the We've got a strange, very strong religious Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tell us your name and where you're from. Gary Pay, Ocean Oh, you're not even in the district. Okay. We're glad you came. I want to talk about my wife. Who's been, uh, she's had a lovely role in this since uh, October of uh, 2015. And I'm the living proof of dealing with Obama. 
<laughs> my plan is, is leading the way, so we're going to my plan. Okay. I've read about it briefly, but I don't have like an expert opinion on it. But why don't you give that to Meg, who's standing right next to you, so we have the actual bill number. And it sounds like something that I would not support doing. But, you know, I'm going to do it. Listen, we have to hold the president accountable for the things that he said, okay? He said, I don't want to mess with Medicaid and I don't want to mess with Social Security. He said, I want to see lower, I want to see lower uh, insurance rates for people. I want to see lower drug costs. Okay. Okay, we have to hold him accountable for the things that he specifically said regarding these issues. That's how it works in democracy. We have to hold him accountable for these things. We can't. The, one of the things that's happening, very, we're going to go to the next question. How to do it is to organize by these 16 communities to write letters to the editor so the energy that is in this room gets spread like a, a tidal wave across our entire district where we get the independents and the moderates and the Republicans to understand the specifics of the issue. Because right now, everybody is being bombarded with so much information, and they're like ping balls, whack-a-mole, you know, something new, some bright, shiny object is catching their attention today, tomorrow, and people are not organized, they're jumping all around, and the president is taking advantage of this, this fury that exists in people. So we need to be organized and go after it piece by piece by piece. People are living in echo chambers. The people who watch Fox News think this way, and the people who listen to this station think that way. We have to be organized. And we, the people, have to spread the word through local newspapers. One of the only growing sources of, of trusted media is local newspapers. We need to use our Facebook pages. We need to use our, but we need to reach out to people, not just to people just like ourselves. We need to go door to door, quite frankly, if we do it right, where we're actually talking to people and persuading people that things that we're saying are reasonable and not just reactionary. We're actually making sense because we have thought out ideas as to how to solve these problems. I had a meeting the other day, I won't say who it was, with really active people, fired up people. I said to one of you, I said, you should run for office. He said, oh, I was thinking about, I said, who's your assemblyman? He said, I don't know. I've been doing it for two years, involved a whole big group of people, and you know who's assembly person is. People have got to get involved at the local level. There's elections this year for town supervisor and for county executive and for all these local races that have a tremendous impact on whether politics works or doesn't work. You have to pay attention and get involved with this stuff. You know, God forbid this energy dissipates, because the elections that matter on the national level don't happen for two years. And for Trump, if he doesn't get a people say, impeach, impeach, you can't just impeach because you're saying it. If he's here four years from now, you know, you get a, we have to win. So to do that, you have to be organized. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. She likes me, she says. I she says. <laughs> Who wants to ask a question about a
affordable health care, raise your hand. Okay, we're going to do three more questions, okay? So three more on affordable health care, then we're going to move to another area. Okay, now did I already say someone was going to go? No. Okay, this woman here, then someone way in the back, someone in the back, and then, and then go to the because you. I'll get you on the neck. I'll give you four questions. And that guy, okay. So one, two in the back, three, and then four. Okay, go ahead. My name is Hello, Jessica. situation and I want to hear from everybody in this room who's going to fight to protect Jessica. their questions towards me. Okay, so thank you very much. There's a guy that used to work for me. He's a very smart guy, Archie Anelli, who uh, is now used to be that my director of budget and finance, my deputy county executive of budget and finance. He ran the National University Medical Center, and he now runs a hospital in the city. And he asked me to actually look at that. And I have looked at it, and I, I haven't made any kind of decision on it. I understand why people think that it's a very bad idea, and they think it's not reasonable. But it doesn't mean that we can't talk about different ideas that are out there. So I appreciate what you're saying. I'm not saying I'm going to do that. But, but, I'm, but I, talking about things is a healthy, the right thing to do. And this does keep affordable care for those who want it. The, the idea is, is that states like New York, for example, would keep the stuff we have and actually expand upon it. And states that don't want to do this stuff could do their stuff that they want to do, and which they've already opted out of. Stage rights isn't is a doctor. Okay. Okay. Where is the? Uh, who's my third person? I forget who the third one was. You were four. Four. Okay. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania. 
indivisible from Northern Queens. Hold the microphone up close to you. To have health care. So we actually had a meeting in your office the other day, um, and I brought something up to you that I don't know if you knew prior, but they keep saying the Republicans or the media that the Republicans don't have a plan. They have a plan. To ourselves privatizing. Um, Tom Price, who is our new Health and Human Services Secretary, had a bill. 2015, that laid out all the groundwork. It's on the internet, you can read the whole thing. I advise you to get some aspirin as you read it. And one of the details in his bill, which is a great talking point for Democrats, and I'm curious why Democrats do not go after them aggressively the way they went after Obamacare before the ink was dry or it was even practiced. Doesn't make sense, right? You can't go to a fight, a knife, a uh, gunfight with a knife, and they're coming at us with a goose knife. So in Price's bill, which has been spoken about for the bill that Brian rolled out on a Friday when nobody listens to any news, has a provision in it that will impact the health insurance you get from your job. So how many people get health insurance from their job? Everybody, right? Almost everybody, 85% of people probably get it. Family and yourself. So what they want to do is they want to recover about $216 million that they don't get because our, the value of our health insurance is not taxed as income. But they want to change that. They want that money. So they want to put a cap on individuals to I think about $8,000 and families to about 20. So one of two things are going to happen. Either your employer is going to say, I'm still going to give you good health care, but you have to pay the rest of it, and then you're also going to get taxed. Or they're going to give you really cheap insurance that doesn't cover anything. So either way, you're going to get screwed. That's where the devil's in the details. And that's just one part of their plan. The other part is they want to base it on age, the little voucher that they're going to give you, not on income. So somebody who's like Rex Tillerson, right, he's 64 and he's a rich guy that's our Secretary of State, he'll get a big chip that he doesn't need. But some guy that works at Starbucks who's 21 is not going to get much at all. So they have a plan. Now I know that you're not running the leadership, I understand that. But I think it's time to get out the UC. I think it's time to say whatever we have to say, go after Price. And I hear you two members of your caucus and the other members that they were co-sponsors of Price's bill. Who is that? I can't think of the names of Tom Wright and I'll find out. There's three, right. one from Ohio you, and the other. So you get that bill? Get the Price bill that he's on. That's my husband. He's a very good memory. Thank you, honey. <laughs> You didn't make your big point. Our big point that she made at our meeting was, let's go after the Republicans for the fact they'll be raising everybody's taxes by going after their health insurance. So let's get the folks in Washington and start researching that. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, you're number four. Go ahead. Give him the microphone. Yeah. My father has a great what's, what's, your, what's your name? I'm a uh, Maxwell Shulman. I'm from right around here, buddy. Thank you. Hey, uh, my father has a great Parkinson's disease and was recently laid off by his employer, which caused him to lose his health insurance coverage. The ANC for the next people like my father, those with pre existing conditions, from being discriminated against when applying health insurance. The pre existing condition was eliminated. My father will have to choose, uh, my father and my family will have to choose between our financial well being and my father's well being. 25 other families enrolled in the ACA in this district they have to make the same decision. So, Mr. Swazi, can you assure me that this position, uh, that this provision will be held in the ACA, or at least that you will fight for a replacement bill that will have this position that protects people with pre existing conditions? Absolutely. You know, when you hear the story, there's many more stories in this room just like the stories that we've heard here. This is real life stuff. 
This is not just like, you know, political blather and talking points and talking. These are people's lives. There are so many people so scared right now that this will affect their lives in devastating ways. So it's important that, you know, I, I can't emphasize this enough. We have to organize. We have to take this energy and use it in an organized direction to address concerns like the pre-existing conditions that people are talking about. To address the concerns that there are problems, there are existing problems with the affordable health care. We want to fix, make it better. But the first thing we have to do is the first line of defense is stop them from repealing it because it's so many people will be devastated by it. Okay. I want to move on to the next topic. Who wants to keep on discussing Affordable Care Act before we move on to the next topic? Okay. We've got to move on to the next topic. I'm sorry. The majority rules. Okay. The next topic is, and we'll, and we'll listen, at the end we'll go back to stuff. We'll go back to stuff at the end, okay? The next topic is Trump and Putin and Trump and conflicts of interest. Who wants to ask a question or say something? This gentleman right here, can you give him a microphone? One. That woman in the back with the red uh, jacket on. This guy's been dying to say something over here with the mustache. And the guy over here with the glasses. Oh, I like that. Okay. And five. The five people. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Good find, George. Thank you, Sid. Thank you. Hold the microphone up to you now. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. How can we get? And I heard on the radio this morning that the Congresswoman Collins from Maine would like to issue a federal subpoena to get Trump's taxes. Exactly what he said. So he, uh, Sid Fine from East Norwich, just asked a question that he heard on the radio this morning that Senator, not Congressman, Senator Susan Collins said that she, she's a Republican, said that she wants to issue a subpoena to get Trump's taxes. And I haven't heard that, so that's good to hear. That's a big deal. It's a very big deal. I think I'm a co-sponsor of a bill with Jerry Nadler to do the same thing. So. Uh, that's really good to hear that, that she's, that she's saying. So that's that's one of the most important things we need to do to find out what's really going on with these relationships. So I'm 100% uh, supportive of that, and it's something that we should do. Right. Yes. That's that's the uh, that's the issue that I'm on with that. Okay. The woman in the red in the back. He's going to bring you a microphone if you want a microphone. All right, I know, you gotta drive back to Oceanside. I'll see you later. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. What was that? You might come up into the middle of the aisle. So, you can maybe a little bit closer. Hello. Okay, come my name is Cheryl Silverman, and I'm from Huntington. Um, I'm very worried about Russia's involvement in our elections. Yes. Because I think it's really a threat to our democracy. I agree. Um, and I'm particularly worried about the involvement of the Trump campaign in the election. Um, I think there should be a bipartisan commission looking at this, and I guess I'm wondering what kind of pressure, what's happening, and what kind of pressure can be put on to create a bipartisan commission? This is why, you know, this is really... You know, some people would say, we don't need a bipartisan, we need a nonpartisan, we need independent investigation. So what really needs to be done? And this, I, we have to emphasize this, this is why you are so important, and I, I don't want you to underestimate what's working, okay? It's work, what's happening, you know, the delay of what's going on with the ACA is happening because of you. But the delay of the travel ban is happening because of you and, of course, the courts. But in this particular issue, what we really need are reasonable Americans that will put their country before their party to help us to get bipartisan support on this issue. So, you know, for 50 years, longer than 50 years, since the McCarthy era, okay, the Republicans have tried to paint the Democrats as the unpatriotic ones, and the Republicans are the patriotic ones, which is not true at all. But this is a generational opportunity for the people in this room 
to say as a matter of patriotism, as a matter of love for your country, more than partisanship, love for your country, we want to know what's going on with Russia and Putin and Trump. If you care about your country, you want to know the answer to this question. So we need you, we need you think, think truthfully, keep the truth and American ideals alive. We need you to write letters to your local paper, to talk to your friends and neighbors. You know, this whole thing where families are fighting with each other because they disagree about their political position. They're, you know, where people are blocking people from their Facebook page because they can't believe that they're possibly thinking this way. And everybody's just so, we're all so divided, we're all so against each other. You know what we need to do? We need to talk to each other. We need to educate each other as to what's really going on here. You tell people this story that the Kingdom of Bahrain had their party at the Ritz Carlton and they moved it into the Trump Tower, the Trump Hotel. They're like, why would they do that? Oh. <laughs> so we need to, to, to promote these type of facts to people so that people will pay attention as to what's going on. You know, a lot was written in the, in the unclassified documents that clearly demonstrate that Putin directed people, the news agency in Russia, to be involved in elections, election, to, evolve, to uh, out, uh, impact that. It's clear as day. And people think, oh, it's fake news. You need to document it and show it to your friends and spread the word. That's what the, this is a very, I can't, I've, I've had these town hall meetings, like I said, my whole career. I've been doing this for a long, long time. This is such a powerful group of people if we're organized and moving in the same direction. And you know, we're not gonna get everything 100% that we all agree 100%. I'm, I'm sure I've said things tonight that pissed off some people in the room, okay? But we were never gonna be like that. I was with some people the other day, they're like, well, you know, Hillary Clinton was no, well, think how much better it would be if Hillary Clinton was the president. Yeah. And these people, these people voted for Bill Stein. And they said, well, Thayer instead of Al Gore. I mean, you know, think what happened. So we just gotta, we gotta, so the example that, that Friedman gives in his book, is he talks about the Arab Spring, and he talks about the power of the internet, and how all these people came together to expose what was wrong in Egypt, and they overthrew President Mubarak for all the bad stuff he was doing, but they weren't organized. And so when there was a vacuum, when he was gone, the Muslim Brotherhood came in and took over Egypt. You have to be organized. You have to be part of a team. You're not gonna get 100% of what you want, exactly the way you want it, that's not how it works. You gotta, you gotta try and be a force that works together to actually try and change things. Okay, who was number three? Wait, I had somebody pick the number three before. Who was it? Yeah. Oh, it was this guy over here. Oh, no, it was this guy. Yes. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Cook. I own a small business in East Northport, and I was also elected by you all to represent you at the ESP for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Hold the microphone. Oh, my apologies. Um, so the question that I have is, is in relation to something that I've been seeing crop up for really the better part of a decade, and that is the militarization of our police force. Now, there's a reason why I bring this up in this particular context. Hold the microphone. Sorry. There's a reason why I bring it up in this particular context, and it's because I happen to have held a fellowship at the University of Buenos Aires. Now, these are folks with whom I have worked these are folks who are with whom I have worked who have experience with dictatorship in a very tangible way. Now, the reason I bring this up is because we do have a militarization of the police force, and in and since 9-11, we have also had the passage and the doubling down of the Patriot Act. Um, my concern here is that we have had many instances where folks have had to circle the wagons to protect their own individual rights, and moreover, and this is really the crux of my question here, is um, in what ways are you going to advocate for the protections of net neutrality? So I'm very glad you brought up the success of our experience, because precisely this, we need to do as much as possible uh, in order to protect the integrity of, of the internet. We have to come out forcefully against that things that were bipartisan, and I remind you, so uh, keep up. These are all things that are, in fact, curtailing our ability to express ourselves in any way that we can. Um, and I, I would love for you to be forceful in that respect. 
Um, the second thing that, that I also think is, is very close to this is there has been an interesting thing, and in the spirit of bipartisanship, really, um, a, a bill that was introduced, I believe, just today by, by Jake, interestingly enough, it's H.R. 1061 and 1062, the full text of which I don't know is, is available. Uh, but what it does do is actually require a warrant for the utilization of Stingray software. Stingray software is the, is the software that can be used to locate an individual anywhere utilizing their, their cell phone. So as to say, to this point, it has not been a requirement to have a warrant to use this particular software to pinpoint an individual's location. So we have first a militarization of our police department since 9-11, and then further, we have had concerted and bipartisan effort to curtail our freedom and our civil liberties on the internet, the most powerful platform. And the final thing, and this really is critically important, we as a civilization invented a technology, and that technology, we get one chance not to screw it up. Please don't. Okay. I want to first of all, I want to thank you very much for sticking to the topic of Putin and Trump. I appreciate that very much. But, uh, you know, listen. No, no, you're right. Yeah, so the bottom line is, is that uh, I'm a supporter of net neutrality, and there's a congressman in California who represents uh, Silicon Valley, who's a freshman, just started with me. His name is Ro Connor, and you should really look him up. He's really a great leader on that particular topic and on other areas of that area, uh, in that area. So look up Rogue Con. Really, I don't want to be combative. Okay. Come on, come on, So, 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 the, listen. This is very important. And I'm not going to be a conspiracy theorist, but we have to really be always have this in the back of our minds, okay? When people are afraid, the government will often try and come in and say, "I'm going to protect you." And to protect you, I need to take away these particular protections that you have. And we have to be conscious of that. And it may be happening, you know, uh, without a, a concerted effort to make it happen. It may just be happening organically. But who knows? So we have to always guard against the idea of when people are afraid. I mean, think about the stuff that Trump is doing. These people are we're afraid of the Muslims. <laughs> We're afraid of the immigrants. We're afraid of this, we're afraid of that. So when we're afraid, you see things happen all in the name of safety. I'm all for safety. I want America to be safe, I really do. I want us to be safe, but we can't give up who we are in the process. That's why what you're doing is so important. Okay, I'm gonna need my, my team to help me keep track of who's number four, he's right over here, number four. Okay. I'm also a member of the Manhasset Point Washington League of Women Voters and proud to be on the board. Uh, and I'm also a computer scientist. So about the Putin, Putin thing, the involvement that uh, Russia appears to have had with our elections, there's been some evidence that the swing states on the electronic machines have a different pattern of voting than the manual machines. Specifically, a more representative of many more women voted for Putin than voted for Putin. I'm Irish and I speak straight. But many, many, many more women voted uh, for Trump. I'm surprised more people didn't hold up their I agree sign. <laughs> Machines, uh, women, more women voted for, uh, for Hillary, and in another area there was another other big swing. That bit. These are statistical analysis that's been done that say there's something wrong. Now, I'm also a computer scientist, and I've put, well, I've put government dollars into my computers. I had a $20 billion computer center, and uh, that, that we did $20 billion a day. So I know what can be done with with computers. I help the FBI with stuff that stuff like that. So this is a very serious thing, and this idea of independent uh, analysis is very critical, but there's also a, a need for uh, some heavy-duty uh, technical hitters to do their analysis too, and, and I, I volunteer to work with you, or 
for the people that are on it. But you really need to get some very, very sophisticated uh, uh, talent together to do the analysis of this thing because there's some serious, uh, we've been screwed in plain, plain English, okay? And we've got to do something about it, okay? And so, so, so thank you, thank you, Bob. Thank you very much. So, so what, what, so what I would like to do is organize, I'd like to organize by two different ways. So tonight we're only going to talk about one of them, but you're a segue into the two. I would like to organize by geography the 16 neighborhoods, and then I want to organize by topic. So we could organize on the five topics that we did here tonight, and other topics that people want to get involved, but we could have a, a committee of people that work on ACA and preserving ACA. We could have a, 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 we could have a committee on uh, 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 Putin and, and Trump. We could have a committee on emoluments clause. We could have a committee on the travel ban. We could have a committee on women's health. We could have a committee on immigration. So, you know, the idea is to take this energy and get the director and use it to bring other people into the cause. So that, that that's not as exciting as this is. It's not, it's boring in my comparison. That's right. Very but boring, but, but very when you cool. win. It's really exciting, trust me. I Thank you. Thank winning you. is very good. I've done both. <laughs> this young man right here. Oh, who's next? This, yeah, this guy was next, that's right. Okay, my, my, my question is very brief. I'm Joe Burris. Uh, my wife and I live in Jericho. I'm a lifelong Long Islander. Congressman Swazi. Will you support a bill to require every candidate for national office, president, vice president, to disclose their tax? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. 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 That was his question. That was your question too? The same question? Require future elections that it be a requirement for the public office. Add their tax returns with this. Okay. You guys are on the committee. You guys are on the committee. You're on the same committee. Okay. That was Trump and Putin. Who wants to keep on discussing Trump and Putin? Raise your hand. Who wants to move on to the next topic? Okay, next topic. Now we're going to talk about the travel ban. Okay? Travel ban. You want to you talk about the travel ban? You can do like Michael did over there. Uh, a little variation. All right. All right, give him the... Give him. I mean, I'll do five people on the, on the travel ban, okay? So that gentleman's first, that gentleman is second. You're gonna go right next to each other. You guys help each other out, so I had One guy back there with the mustache and the beard. This guy standing up here, number four. And this woman over here, number five. Congressman Swansea, um, I understand safety and security is very important to this nation in, in light of what has happened, especially following 9-11. The thing I find most enigmatic to me is following 9-11, uh, we've had a couple of terrorist attacks, if you want to call them domestic terrorism, one in Florida and San Bernardino, California. I understand that. Putting those two aside, I believe the last time you had a terrorist attack on one of those seven nations earmarked by Trump's committee was probably in 1975. How come there's nothing done at all, by the Republicans, I know it's difficult to respond to this, but I want to know if it's any way possible, without being clear point, for something to be done about the lack of gun control. They're on the average. On the average, there are 34,000 deaths a year through gun violence, granted a percentage as the suicides, but still, about a week ago, I read about an incident in Florida where an eight-year-old boy shot two siblings. One died, the other was in critical condition. Republicans never, never talk about that when they discuss safety and security. All they talk about is terrorism and doing something about that fucking more money. Why is there nothing done? And that's how screwed up things have become in this environment. That that's not one of the five top topics is with gun violence. No, I don't. It's true, though. It's true. It's true. That's how, you know, that's how it's monumental. 
and it has to be discussed. I understand there have been attempts, President Obama, especially following the incident in Connecticut. So, you know, so Hook, he made every attempt. Let me, let me address your question. Sure. It's always about the money. It's always about the money. You want to change, you want to change our, uh, the Affordable Care Act in a way that's reasonable? Who doesn't want it to change? Well, the insurance companies and drug companies don't want it to change. You want to change something about gun violence in America? When we had the shootings in Orlando, where all those people were killed in the nightclub with an with a automatic weapon, the sale of automatic weapons went through the roof that week. So whatever the issue is, you want, you want to do something about climate change? You know? But, but look, the oil companies and the gas companies, it's, this is, we're not talking about like billions of dollars. We're talking about trillions of dollars. So it's always it goes to the money somehow. That's why people being active and involved and person to person can make a difference because if you're not paying attention, the money will always control the conversation. I, I really want to... but it would be very difficult to do. There's a guy named Mike Thompson from California, who's a hunter, who's, uh, I think he's a veteran also, who's in charge of the Gun Violence Prevention Task Force for the Democrats. And he came and did a town hall meeting with me in Huntington, the Huntington Library during my campaign. And he presented, and I had people that, I had a guy in the front who was a libertarian, member of the NRA, who had run for governor on the libertarian line. And I had a woman whose daughter was murdered in Arizona who lived in the district. Or that she lives in Nashville, Kansas, in the district. But you know, they're on two opposite ends of the spectrum. By the end of the meeting, we all agreed that there has to be universal background checks. There's no reason that anybody would have opposed the universal background checks. But it's a matter, this is why I'm so committed to this idea. You know, a lot of my staff, a lot of my political advisors, didn't want me to be involved in the Problem Solvers Caucus because they felt that people at a meeting like this would be like, no, you don't work with them. I said, but I'm not, I'm not in politics just to get elected. I want to actually do something. And I am so convinced that the only way to actually do something is you have to persuade people that are not just exactly like you, that you're being reasonable. And then you get people in the middle, and even people over the other side, to see the reason of your ways. And you can actually get something done. But it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, and it's exhausting. But that's what it takes. Everything, it's 
told, look, go in there. You got to work at it. You got to keep on pushing. You gotta keep, I guarantee you, you keep on pushing, you keep on fighting, you keep on doing it. You'll change the world. You'll make things better. But you have to work on it for a long period of time. And that's very hard to do. And you can't operate out of fear. Okay, where? I'm, I'm, I'm out of track. Okay, go ahead. Um, it's my name's Omar Hamlet. I came here with Ali. Um, so I kind of want to talk about American exceptionalism. I maybe it's my youth. I've been a strong believer in the idea that America is exceptional. Let me tell you why. Um, we made a huge mistake in World War II where we turned away boats full of Jewish refugees. So we gave up here. We made the world leader in taking refugees around the world and showing a moral example to the rest of the world. My parents, who have now this is now their third country that they've been in. Because they've had to leave one country, they've now come here and have not played with. They actually were also some of them we classified under that. What would you do? You know, we saw this refugee ban, we saw the food, we can see the impact this has on the way people think about America. What do you think you can do despite a Republican Congress that seems unwilling to work? What can you do to restore my faith and create a lot of people with the idea of American exceptionalism? I think that's a great sentiment, and this is a bit of American exceptionalism right here. This is it. This is it. This is this is people who believe, and they should not walk out of here with anything but a stronger belief that by being involved, you can actually have an impact on things. And it's because people are inspired by this country, and things look, you know, a little scary right now. But you know, we've had major problems with a lot of different groups. You know, think about you know, when, the, when the Dutch were here, they discriminated against the English. And then the English and the Dutch discriminated against the Germans. The Germans and the Dutch and the English discriminated against the Irish. And then they all discriminated against the Italians and the Jews, and now it's the Latinos and the, and, and the uh, 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 Muslims, and the African Americans have had it bad since day one. So, but I mean, but you know what? We're constantly working to overcome that. And that's one of the beauties of this country. And so we just need to stick together and keep on pushing and getting people to stick with us as part of the conversation. Uh, thank you for your invitation. Thank you so much. Now this man in the back is supposed to go. Syed, you were supposed to team up with him. What do you think? Let, let this guy go first. Yeah, all right. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, sir. Uh, Congressman. It's obvious at this point that the Trump administration has a clear anti-Muslim sentiment they are building. You have the luxury of being able to send a clear message to Trump and his cronies by supporting Keith Ellison as the first Muslim head of the DHC. Trump gives the big show of and unity, as you said. Do you support Keith Ellison? No. no. I'm not going to get into the DNC politics, right? I don't have a vote in it. I don't have a vote. Okay. Okay, okay. Everybody, everybody, direct their comments towards me. Direct their comments towards me. This is, listen, this is not about the DNC politics tonight. We can do that some more, okay? We'll do that some more. But I, I'm not supporting him for, for the answer. Okay, I'm not looking for applause, and I'm not looking for a tag. I'm just stating my position. You, I think it's your turn, yes. Sir. I don't have a stated candidate that I support. Yeah, hello, my name is uh, Paul. Uh, you spoke about refugees before. I'll talk a little about, a bit on that. But in my opinion, most important thing is honesty. We need to be honest. Now, you spoke about refugees before, but you left out what the United States has done to cause millions and millions of refugees and dead people all over the Middle East. And you were on the Foreign Relations Committee, and you were on the Armed Defense Armed Services Committee, correct? Yes. So I'm pretty sure you do know about these things. So we spent 57% of our budget on military things, counting debt and everything. 
Well, we can we can argue that, but we know we spend a lot. Of it's not that high, but okay, it's a big number. It's a big big number. But anyway, we've been in an endless war of terror that has led to Trump, with all the refugees rushing into Europe and everything else that has ensued. So you were on those committees. Tulsi Gabbard went to Syria. She made her report. Now I'd like to know what you were going to do to get us out of this war of terror unless you want to keep us in. So, and I want honesty about yeah, what the United States is, the what honesty. we've done. We just, one last thing, we just did some killing in Yemen. Why are we killing in Yemen? I'd like to know. Okay. You guys are Congress, it's up to you to declare war, to fund these missions. Obviously, you are funding them. So, explain to us why. Okay, to be honest with you, I've been there for 50 days, <laughs> and I haven't voted to fund anything yet as far as wars or terrorism. Um, so, I'm the, okay, hold, use the microphone on this. Yeah, use the microphone, tell us who you are. Yeah, you do trust me. I think it's important. Then well, you? you address, I am Ryan. <laughs> I think it's important that you address the audience because a lot of these people, including myself, are new delegates to this forum. And I think we need to manage their expectation about exactly what you're going to be able to achieve, what you're hoping to achieve, the virtues and limitations of being in a powerless party. What are our realistic expectations? That's good. We cannot address everything. That's good. You really can't. So I think it's important. Okay, let's start. Thank you, Mike. That's very helpful. All right, let me ask this first question. How many of you, is this like over the past, since the election, really the first time that you've really been active in politics? Now, you see that? That's amazing. Everybody should look around. No, raise your hands. Raise your hands. Everybody look around at everybody so they see how many people are getting involved that have ever been involved before. That's an amazing, positive, good, wonderful thing. That's a big, big deal. But my wife, Helene, is up here with me. She'll be the first one to say, why weren't they involved before? You know? No, no. No, no, no. no. And I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that in a critical way of anything. Everybody is so bombarded with stuff on TV these days. So bombarded with stuff on the internet. So much commercial, so much media, so much sell, so much buy, 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 buy. And they just bing, 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 and they don't focus on the stuff. And they're getting focused. And that's a great, wonderful thing. But the key of the whole thing is to get people who agree with each other to work together to win. Because if you don't win, then you can't do anything. So, let me just finish another thing. So, you know, I've been in pol politics for a while, okay? I, I, I don't know if you guys know this, okay? But I was the mayor for eight years. I was the county executive of Nassau County. I ran for governor of New York State in a Democratic primary against Elliot Spitzer. That did not turn out very well for me. That didn't turn out very well for Elliot Spitzer. As a matter of fact, I, I lost the race then, and then I lost the race to Ed Mangano. Okay? Anybody who beats me in a race, their whole life gets ruined, so you don't want to beat me. So, but anyway, so, but you know what? You gotta win. If you don't win, you can't do the stuff you want to do. So you have to win. So we can all fight amongst ourselves about different things that we don't agree upon, but we have to figure out how to win. So, there's only so much you can do when you don't have the presidency, you don't have the Senate, and you don't have the Congress. Right now, Chuck Schumer is probably one of the most powerful Democrats, probably the most powerful Democrat in the United States of America, because he's the bulwark against getting 60 votes in the Senate. So, we really have to look to him for leadership to save us from being overrun, because it's the only thing that stops us from being steamrolled right now. The other thing, over time, if we're effective, if we're effective, people like us working together will persuade moderates and independents and some Republicans of the wrong-headedness of things like repealing the ACA, of allowing the president to deal this closely with Putin, of banning Muslims, of 
deporting and facing all this fear on all these immigrants and of getting rid of, of the environmental ones, that'll be the hardest one, getting rid of all the, they're gonna could do that no matter what, because of the money. But we have to work at this with people we know person by person by person. I, 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 I don't want to keep up sounding like a, dead, a, a broken record. This is so powerful that you are in this room and that there are so many of you like this and there are places like this going all over the country. Don't blow it by cannibalizing ourselves and fighting against ourselves. <laughs> and figure it out, when you look at the country, okay, when you look at the country, we got New York and the Northeast, we got California and the Northwest, and a few other spots of blue. They got this big, huge thing of red. We gotta figure out what's going on there. What happened? And we have to learn how to communicate with them and communicate on the terms that they care about. The issues we've talked about tonight, if we talk about them in reasonable terms and discuss the reasonable ways to address these issues, we can persuade those people that it's in their self-interest to not see AC, ACA uh, the, the repeal. It's not in their interest to have our president working with the, the, the head of Russia. It's not in our interest to have make people fearful the way we're doing that. Okay, so everybody wants to say stuff. Wait a minute, you're number five, okay. She gets the microphone. You want to take my microphone? No, 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 Say your name. Okay, um, my name is Anu, and um, I am an American, so is my husband. We were both born in another country. And I just wanted, um, I just wanted everyone to know what extreme betting means, because I don't think the United States government can bet any more than they already are. Twenty years ago, my husband and I came home. We were both under eighteen, and I'm pretty sure he felt stressed out as much as my family did for about six months before we came to this country. We had all sorts of medical examinations to go through. I was 15 and I was put through the ringer for all sorts of medical examinations. I had to go to a specialty clinic that reported to the U.S. Embassy only. I couldn't go to my own private physician. I had my finances checked, my parents' finances checked, and the finances of the people who were providing us support in this country. And after all of those months of background check and medical check, came here and were held at the airport for five hours where I was practically, I mean, I might as well have been hung upside down for all the questions they asked me, a 15-year-old kid coming on a green card, by the way, not on any other visitor visa or or anything like that. That was 28 years ago. I'm not sure why the Democrats are not using examples like these and the current vetting processes that are used by the United States government. Much more stringent than it was when you came. Far more stringent. And I was 15. And I felt like I was being beaten upside down at the airport at JFK after 28 hours in the flight. And after six months as a student getting my background checked and my medical things checked and my parents' financials checked, everything checked for the people who were sponsoring us in this country and in India. So I'm surprised that, that, that Democrats like you and your colleagues are not highlighting these stories. What does the chain mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And another thing that I think that the Democrats have been glossing over, and I am a lifelong Democrat, so please do not boo me, but George W. Bush said he was in favor of instant gun check, instant background check for gun shows. Why did the Democrats gloss over that? Why did you not, why did the party not bring this up several times? Their own president, who, who, was in t who was in office for two terms said this, but it wasn't highlighted enough, huh? Yeah. Well, I, you know, you're right, it would be better than it is. But I was going to introduce these two young girls here who are embarrassed by their mother speaking. Come up here, girls. Come up here for a second. Mommy's talking. Come on. I want these two very nice to see you. I want these two girls to know that I am a first generation American. My father was born in Italy, and I hope they will see Tommy first or something.
All right, this is what we're gonna do with the face of the crowd so that everybody's in the picture. Everybody wants to stand up and take a pull up. Everybody stand. Too much fun, you're right. Too much fun. Okay. All right. I see some people are starting to leave, okay? Let me just, before you leave, I really want people, please, go on to the Facebook page. That, first of all, I have two Facebook pages. One Facebook page is my campaign slash political page. On that page, is the stuff that is related to New York's third will be heard. Then you go on Heard of the Third, www.Heard of the Third, and you can sign up for one of these 16 neighborhoods to join a committee. We hope to be built committees by each neighborhood throughout the district. My government page, I can't even talk about at this forum. So I'm not telling you to go on my Facebook page for my government page. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, now we're, we did the five questions on the, on the, oh no, we got one more question. Let this guy go first. He's ahead of you. Hello, Congressman. Hi. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I met you last year, lovely, and I asked you this, and you didn't give me an answer. Now I'm back. I'm answering. Every year after a presidential election, we always have a lot of energy, and people are ready to go, and the goal that you're seeing is to get other people Involved, who don't agree with us and who don't really care for politics. But I know from experience, because I go to a high school, that young people really don't care about politics for one simple reason. That's because they don't trust their government. People from the ground up take money from lobbyists, and we say we have to fight the drug companies. The Democrats and Republicans take money from the drug companies. So what can we do as a person? What can we do? stop this corruption, because if that doesn't stop, then nothing will ever get done. Okay, that's really clear. But I can't imagine I would have answered that question before, because when I was in law school, my senior year of law school, I wrote the report, I helped write the report for the New York State Commission on Government Integrity. And, the top, and I won the New York State Bar Association Ethics Award my senior year for the work that I did as a volunteer on that report. And you know what the topic was? campaign finance reform. And for 30 years since then, whatever, however long that is since I graduated from law school, uh, in, in 1989, the, nobody cared about campaign finance reform. The good news of the last election is people finally understand, like this gerrymandering question this woman brought up here earlier, gerrymandering and campaign finance reform are two of the most important things that need to happen in order for us to clean up our politics. That's what I just said. I just said that. Yeah. Okay. So you need the public to be involved and organized to go after that issue. But it starts with you. Okay. With I'm in favor of campaign finance reform. You take money from lobbyists too. So it starts with the politicians. That's all I know. Okay. All right. Go ahead. That's one of the activities we're going to do in Heard the Third. When I talk to people who I work with, young people in their 20s, I don't vote. I'm not political. That's bullshit. Yeah. You can help by changing, helping to change when 
There was actually a bill that Steve Israel had, which was called Why Tuesdays? Why is Why is the election on Tuesday? Why is it not on a Saturday? You know, so more people can vote. It's like, you know, in, in NASA, you know, all these special districts we have, all these crazy districts? This is something I worked on for a long time and really didn't get that far. But they had like a garbage district down in uh, the five towns, which is a very Orthodox Jewish community. They had the vote for the garbage district in the Orthodox community on Friday night, on Shabbos, in the Orthodox community. Anyway, okay. We're, we're supposed to talk about, every, what time is it now? Does anybody know what time it is? Oh, we got plenty of time. Okay. Uh, let's talk about immigration, if that's okay. Who's in favor of moving on to immigration? Raise your hand. Who's against the idea of moving on to immigration? Okay, we're going to immigration. Okay. Who wants to do, you want to do a question on immigration? No, I just want to follow a question about the ACA, I mean, uh, about campaign finance reform. Because it came up several times tonight, and that was really the main question I wanted to ask you. Um, this, I think, is an area of opportunity for you as a junior congressperson, because campaign finance reform is essential, and to me, it's at the root of all evil in politics, right? Steve Israel, your predecessor, said it many times, my son interned him. He said, I spend most of my time trying to you know, break up money for my next campaign. Who wouldn't want campaign finance to be reformed? So my question to you is, are you interested and willing to introduce legislation similar to what Wolfgang Pack is working on now to establish maybe a constitutional convention to do something to really you know, follow up with what you said in law school. It's a very nice idea, it's just not realistic. It's not realistic for me as a junior congressman in the minority party to push this type of legislation. One of the things that I have to do as a congressperson is I have all this stuff coming over the transit. There's a million different things happening every single day. There's no free time. It's very little free time. I just had some free time to speak about his 93rd birthday. I went to go visit her in Florida. But I, I've had very little free time in the past 16 months of my life. And so I have to focus on what are the things that I can spend my time on. I have to spend my time on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I have to spend my time on the Armed Services Committee. I want to focus on some major things that are in my district, the Northport VA, the Beth Page Plume, which is a big polluted site that was grew up prominent, and the Navy are the responsible party. One of the reasons I went on the Armed Services Committee is because the Navy and Grumman are the responsible parties for cleaning up that polluted site. And I figured I could have more influence on trying to get them to do there for 40 years. It's a major, you know, half a billion dollar cleanup. I have the Virgin Marine Academy in my district. I have a major problem with airport noise in northeastern Queens and different parts of Nassau County. I have two major research centers, uh, uh, Coast Bay Harbor Laboratories and the uh, Feinstein Institute. And there's some other things like a Coast Guard facility. But there's a couple other little, but it, already it's like more than I should be doing. So I've got that stuff that I've got to focus on. Then I've decided to make a Problem Solvers Caucus one of my big focuses of, of trying to get Democrats and Republicans. If I could get some Republicans interested, yes, I would do that. If I could get Republicans interested in campaign finance reform and the gerrymandering, I forget who it was that brought that up with you. I don't have the answer for that yet. So, so I'm interested in that topic, and if I can get them, right now, the thing that the group of the Problem Solvers Caucus, which is hard to even get them to meet because everybody's pulled too many directions, which is one of the things, I'm a vice chair of that group now, and I'm taking on the responsibility of getting them to actually meet more often and talk to each other. Right now, they want to focus on infrastructure and tax reform, because they think that's an area where we can find some agreement. Okay, but then the 20 Republicans are not going to work on resistance. That's not so, so, I'm trying to tell you what's realistic, um, what I'm working on, okay? I, the stuff that I'm talking about, I will fight on all the stuff we talked about. I will make statements. I will issue press releases. I will co-sponsor bills. I will go to forums. I will do stuff in the paper. I will talk about all this stuff. But to be effective, I've got to find those things where I can get some Republicans to come over on the side and work with me on those different things. The thing to be most effective, get organized as a group. So I've got a power base, so I can work together with you, and we can go out and influence some things. Okay, we got to move on. Thank you. 
I really want you to sign up on my Facebook page on Erdogan III. Erdogan III. Okay, immigration. Five people on immigration. Okay, who are you pointing to? That guy? You or him? You. Okay. One. Number. Give the microphone to that woman in the back, please. Who wants to do immigration? Question. Two. Three. Four. And five. Terry, go because I know him. Okay. Who is number one? In the back. Go ahead. You hear me? Immigration. Um, I'm going to pull a little bit of Hallie Jackson, April Bryan. This is a two part question. Uh, I'd like to. Who's Hallie Jackson? Oh, uh, NBC News. Okay. okay. Uh, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention about immigration. The first, the first is that I just wanted to know what uh, information. Can you hear? What information you're making available to your constituents for those, most of us probably know someone or have someone work for us or have no dreamers. What information you're gonna make available for your office, for the people who are uh, negatively affected and are frankly terrified um, and may get picked up or just uh, some educational type advice. The second question I have, or the second part of this, is that as I was watching this, I'm not, a naturalized American citizen who was born in Colombia. Uh, as I watched all of this transpire, and I was thinking to myself, you know, the Republican, Trump is clearly trying to just fulfill a campaign promise. You know, he said he was going to do something, and so he typically splashes something out with, with little thought. What's going to happen to the kids who are, who happen to parents or are sent out of the country? Are they going to go into foster care? I mean, the Republicans are interested. I try to approach it from their point of view. So the kids who go into foster care are being paid for as our taxpayer dollars with a, with a parent they don't know, and I took it down the line like this. And when I went down the line further, I found that I think a little known part of the bill is that in order to detain the possibly millions of people, they're going to be using, going back into privatization of detention centers which the Obama administration had stopped. And we all know mass incarceration became a business. And that is one of the reasons that uh, the Republicans never backed moving off of uh, any type of reform in that area. So I want to know what you, how you're going to help make sure that private detention centers don't get used for these people and it doesn't become a business that becomes fruitful and a reasonable and public and safe business. Okay. First, I'm going to let Lester, Lester, our 98-year-old former congressman, is leaving. Let's give him a round of applause and thank him again for being here. Thank you, Lester. Lester is the eighth congressman in Congress and represented the district from 1964 to 81. Lester Wolf! Right. This is I am very happy to see that the seat that I held for eight terms is in good hands right now. We are very important to have a very good Thank you, Lester. 98 year old is a little kid. Do you want to politics or not? Thank you, Lester. God bless you. So, Pam, the I want you to know that. Uh, this is a very important issue to me. I've been very involved with it the entire time I've been involved in politics. And I received awards from every different uh, immigration advocacy group in the area. Even New York City New York Immigration Coalition gave me awards for the work that I did. And I spoke, I pulled up a guy named Pat, Cur uh, Pat Young, who is the lawyer for Caracas, the Central American Refugee EM. I can't remember what the name stands for. Um, just two days ago, uh, because I was asked to go to a big employer in Nashville County, I'm not going to tell you who, where a bunch of people didn't show up for work on purpose for the day of... Uh... Yeah, they were that influence. And so they, they, that, that employer has asked me to come and reassure their employees. So I'm asking Pat Young to actually come with me to that event. And I've asked him, I said, what's the best way I can educate people as to why they shouldn't be scared? And what can I do to actually help them? 
in, in this process. So I'm going to be working with Corayson, who this guy is, Pat Young is the smartest guy around. He's tapped into all the advocacy groups. He knows everything about the law and about what needs to be done. And it's not, a, it's not enough for me to make a speech or something like that. It's going to require a lot of legwork and a lot of time spent talking to people and educating. I can tell you so many personal stories of people through the years that have come up to me, you know, mothers crying, you know, Tommy, my son, I brought my son here when he was a baby, and he was number one in his class, and he went to college, and he did great in college, and he wanted to be a, an engineer, and then he decided to be a law enforcement. And he graduated from school, and now he can't go get a job because he's afraid because he doesn't have papers. So he sits in his room all day because he's so scared. I mean, I know people that work in the restaurant business that are guaranteed undocumented that have an un that have a fake social security card. So when Trump says I'm going to deport people for committing crimes, well, a lot of people have these fake social security cards. There's millions and millions of them. They're they're being deported under this rule. If you get pulled over for a traffic infraction, you could be deported. There are so many people living in fear. So it's a matter of educating, or, and, and, and I forget who this woman who left before. We gotta tell the personal stories of people. One of the most effective things that happened when Trump first, first proposed his travel ban was telling the stories of people that were being held at airports in foreign countries and you know, how they helped the US during the, during the war, or they helped as interpreters or different cities, you have to tell these personal stories and humanize the ACA stories, you have to personalize it. Who's gonna be affected by this in a personal way? The more you tell a personal story, the more real it is to people, instead of just everybody yelling and screaming at each other. So gathering the personal stories is something that we can do as part of our group. Okay. It will be, yes, it will be, but it's you know, gonna take a little bit of time to put everything together and get everybody on the team. Yes, we will do that. And I will go out and speak to groups as well. And I, I'm, a, I'm opposed to those private detention centers. It's very scary because they don't, they don't follow the rules. Okay, who is number two in the, this group? Okay. Don't forget to sign up. www.heard in the third. Um, thank you, Congressman. My name is Cameron Williams. I'm from Miami. Um, the whole talk of illegal immigration and this whole fear of it is really very scary to me because this is a country that was founded by immigrants. In 1620, the Puritans came over here to escape British persecution. Every single person in this room is a descendant of immigrants in some way, shape, or form, no matter how far, far back you go. Back you go. And this country is changing demographically, and there's nothing anybody can do to stop that. And it seems that a certain political party, um, the Republican Party, wants to make it harder for people to vote because they are scared of demographic changes because it means that they will not be able to win elections as easily as, as they used to. You have them cutting polling stations in minority areas, passing voter ID laws that you know, makes you have to have, excuse me, makes it so you have to pay money in order to vote. That is a poll tax. That is one To everybody, you should not have to pay money in order to in order to vote because that is against the constitution. You have all these other things that they are doing because they are scared of losing power. And they're doing a good job. We should be making it easier to vote, not party. You should have things like automatic voter registration in California. If you turn 18 and you are a citizen, you are automatically registered to vote. If you need a ride to the polls, you get a ride to the polls from any political candidate, no matter who you are. That's what they do in Canada. We, we should also be having, um, getting rid of gerrymandering, as, I, as, as you said. But what are you going to do to address this problem of voter suppression that I think costs a lot of votes for I am going to appoint Cameron, the president of the voter suppression team of the Herd in the Third. Mr. President, we got to work on it. I agree. Got to work on it. Okay. Who, who? Number three. Okay. 
My name is Mary Arlen. I'm indivisible Huntington. Yes. Uh, I had the uh, privilege of living briefly under Hitler, and I had to run. And then I lived under Mussolini, and I was incarcerated. Then I lived briefly under Stalin, and I had to run again. Oh, my gosh. You got to make some better decisions. Uh, now I'm living briefly under Trump. <laughs> I'm sure to run again. Make <laughs> sure we get all of this information. We're going to do something with that, okay? That's, we, want to, we want to learn more about that story, okay? Let's give him another round of applause. Next in our group, that guy in the back. Yeah, okay. Thank you for giving this opportunity. This is regarding uh, predecessor congressman Steve Israel. He supported HR 213, 2015. So it's the same thing I'm talking about. HR 392 Act for high skill immigration. I'm living in this country since last 12 years. This is regarding legal immigrants. We are always scared to travel back to our home country. My parents living there, they are crying. We cannot go back. It's uncertainty we are coming back or not here because we are living here nicely. I bought the house, my son's going to the college, but he cannot do the, any uh, internship. This is very unfair to the skilled immigrants. Why, why can't he do the internship? Because he is my de on dependent visa, so he, I'm paying 50,000 year fees in NYU, but he cannot do the internship and he cannot travel to the outside of the country. So this is really unfair to the legal immigrants. Okay, we'll look, we'll look some more into that. So if you know, if you know him very well, just uh, and he has a couple of pictures with you also, my son, he's going to NYU. Okay. And. Uh, this is Steve Israel Congressman, he supported HR 213. So if you help us to this... Uh, 213, 213, 213? Yeah, 213, that is 2015, but now this is HR 392 of 2017. H HR 392. Yes, yeah, if you co-sponsor this thing, it will really help. And this is regarding per country quota. So we don't want that per country green card. Instead, it should be based on a qualified, qualified person, not based on the country. If you have 5,000 green card for this country, that's totally wrong. It should be based on qualified person. Okay. So if you agree with this, it will be a great help. We'll look into that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait a minute. I have a fifth person. Who's the fifth person? Oh, who's the third? Congressman, sounds great. Thank you, Terry. Thank you for representing us and holding this town hall tonight. Terry Machetta from the great city of Lenho. Yay! I was at a, uh, a community forum last week, I think it was, in, in West Ferry. It was uh, set up to help the community, their immigrants, uh, with how, how the executive orders are going to be affecting their lives. So very similar to what you're discussing now. It was uh, moderated by Professor Arthur Dobrin, Rabbi Michael White, and Dr. Isma Chowdhury. Okay. It was the second forum. Was it the Islamic Center? Well, it was at the, uh, that was the first one. The second one was at the, uh, the Westbury Middle School. Okay. And uh, I'm, I asked them if they would come to Glen Cove for the third. It was a panel of maybe 15 people. Assemblyman Chuck Levine was on the panel. Uh, there was a uh, assistant district attorney. Everybody was represented to answer these folks' questions. And it was really heartbreaking to hear, again, the stories of these undocumented immigrants or friends or family members who were, um, you know, who were petrified to live their lives, come out of their houses, go to school, to do English as a second language, go to church. How can we, in our communities, 
harken back to when you were the mayor, what can we be doing to reach out to our immigrant communities to make them feel more safe, more protected? I mean, um, that's what I want to try and do. You know, I actually, again, Helene just sent me something yesterday. Uh, our deputy chief of police, Chris Ortiz, actually wrote an article 10 years ago along the lines of the topic that I was talking about earlier, which is about why it is terrible to have local law enforcement be involved in immigration enforcement, and why it's very bad for community policing. So I think that, uh, I know that I'm gonna be setting up forums, and I'll try and include the police, uh, as well as groups like Carasa. You just have to you reach out to them. It's a matter of just working with them. But I know that the cops, I don't, I don't know for certain, but I'm reasonably sure that the Nassau County Police Department will think that I've done those for a certain. I think, based upon when I was there, that the Nassau County Police Department will not like the idea of working with ICE. That may have changed, but I think that they will not like that. So I'll find out from the local law enforcement officer. You know, right now, you know, this is kind of just the past couple days is when we saw him go back to his old rhetoric. So, we need to get Carason, and we need to get the local law enforcement, and anybody else that we think would be appropriate to help us to educate people. I mean, the groups you mentioned are good groups, but we need to have the experts in the immigration field and the law enforcement field to help us to make people feel safe. If you, I know from, from personal experience, if new immigrants hear law enforcement reinsuring them, that's the most effective thing you can do. Now, we have to make sure that the local law enforcement are actually on the team with us. I don't know that for a fact, because I haven't actually spoken to them yet, but I will. Okay. Okay, got it. Quick announcement. Did you get the microphone, maybe? You're going to be able to go, young man. You're going to be able to go in just a second. I'm with Long Island Archivist, and we're starting an Immigrants' Rights Support Committee. If anybody is interested, um, it's going, the first meeting is going to be at the Cinema Arts Center on March 9th at 7 o'clock. We want to work with those groups on the ground. We just have to go the House for Legal Clinic that's just forming, the Jobs with Justice. And, and WINS, Long Island WINS is a very good group. And WINS, exactly. All of them. Okay. So, anyone who's interested. Thank you. Okay. Is there anybody else ahead of my list of people to go? Okay, let, let this young man go. Um, <laughs> I don't think this is right. Like, having Trump as president, it's, I think he's really bad. I don't know, I don't know how this happened. I don't know how we got this stuck in this mess. But, it's good that we're here Tonight. This is a really valuable time. Fighting against Trump is very, very good. You, you, we gotta do this. This is like he, he's messed up. He's messed up. Should we go open it up to every topic, or should we do the environment first? Yeah. All in favor of the environment, raise your hand. All in favor of every topic, raise your hand. The environment is winning. The environment is winning. We're going to do the, it's 9.09. .09. Okay, we're going for another six minutes, but we will go longer if people want to stay longer. But I, I see a lot of people starting to filter out, so I don't want to lose, lose the group. So, environment questions first, okay? One, we gotta go in the back a little. Two, three, four, five. Okay, I'll get you, I'll get you done.
I'd like to talk about another pesticide, that's being incorporated into many of our plants that we grow and we buy at stores, called neonicotoids. Neonicotoids are a type of pesticide that is used that when an unbeneficial insect goes near it, it gets killed off. It prevents the um, plant from being eaten by the insect. Well, what happens is, is we have bees and other pollinators that come to this plant, because they don't know, they don't have a sign saying, I've been treated with this pesticide. So what happens? Our bees, our pollinators, our beneficial insects are starting to have problems, not being able to reproduce and continue on in their life cycle because these plants are killing them. My question to you is, is you know that Maryland has a state ban on this particular pesticide. Mm. Is this going to be solved as a state by state issue or will it have to be introduced in either the House or the Senate or a federal ban on this particular thing? And seeing that the way um, chemical companies are in pockets of many politicians, how difficult is this going to be to get neonicotoids banned from our country? I don't, I don't think that neo, neonicotoids are on the number one hit parade of Donald Trump and through it right now. But um, we got to educate people about it. So I mean, I think we've all been reading, I, I've been reading about a lot about how we're losing the bees in this country. Has everybody, has everybody heard of that or not? Has yeah, somebody heard of that? So let's use the bee argument because everybody's been hearing about that and that's the first time I heard it was tied directly to neonicotoids. Has anybody ever heard of neonicotoids before? Wow, that's pretty impressive. I didn't hear that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you for educating me on that. Okay, who was number two? Were you number two in the back? You're not number. You're not the five. No, this young man's gonna be six. Six and a half. Graham, Graham, give this lady the microphone, please. The red shirt. Thank you very much. Uh, one, I'd like you to do me a favor. Yes. And please do not use the term clean energy, use renewable energy. Because under the guise of clean energy, I've heard clean coal. There's no such thing as clean coal. I've heard natural gas. And so we have hydrofracking to get this natural gas, which puts more of uh, different types of methane in the air, and, and of course is more global warming than the other uh, gases. So. I think that we have to really concentrate. I had heard, I hate to say it, 40 years ago, we were moving toward renewable energy. Yeah. And we know that the oil companies have suppressed. Think about it, uh, uh, Al Gore was speaking about the problem of climate change when he ran for president in 1988. No, no, I'm sorry, he didn't talk about it. He wrote his book saying, I will never not talk about it again, because he didn't talk about it the next time he ran. Which was just but the countries in Europe, some of them are 50, 60% running on renewable energy, some yep, more. Yep. And we are suppressing constantly. Every time that there are bills that are going to go for money, yep. like uh, even with President Obama, most of the 80% that was going for renewable energy went to China because China was doing the manufacturing yep. of the parts. We've got to start Renewable energy, it would help our economy. So you don't like the term clean money. energy or green energy? You just want renewable I want, energy? Well, I want clean energy not to be used as an umbrella okay. for clean coal and hydrogen. Right. That's, that's legitimate. Thank but, you. But please move forward, bills. I'm 100% on board. I got a, right. such a good record on that. I got nothing to worry about. And get manufacturing of parts here, solar. I'm very big on that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Uh, also issues like vaccine safety, where 
there's uh, a lot of doubt being shed on, on issues that are really based and rooted in evidence. Um, so how is, uh, how is our, you know, you as a general uh, group, when, when these policies come up, who's, who's speaking in people's ears and who's giving the information? You, you can do that. You can help <laughs> your scientific experts. Because I, we there's see a lot of people policies. here that have a lot of talent. We just have to harness this talent and use it in a good way. There are many people that already I'm speaking to. So you're on the team. Where do you involved. live? Where do you live? Here in Plainview. Done. You're All on right. the team. Uh, well, well, we'll, we'll talk then. <laughs> you're going to be one of our leading scientist experts. That's how, that's just, it, it, it sounds simplistic. That's the way it works. You get people to all sign up to do their piece, and together we're a very powerful group of people. It's just a matter of people all doing their little part. Nobody has to like say, oh, I'm gonna miss my job, or I don't have time for these people. The meetings will not be like this, like this long, <laughs> if you don't want them to be. It's just a matter of putting in the time to do it, and then organizing, and going and do something with it. Take advantage of the, the fact that all these other people are as interested as you are. Okay, who is the next person on our list? I had the person. Okay, yes. Yeah. Okay, Barry. Get the microphone for this gentleman right here. and turned over the soil. 
to start the project to demonstrate it. Then, most recently, EPA said, no, no, more, more remediation has to be done. Oh, after that? After that, right? But the politicians in Glencoe are pushing it forward. It's very dangerous to the humans who are going to be living in that area. It probably never, it, it, the, the, the structures probably should never be put on that land. It's not safe. And yet, Mayor Spinello and the council don't listen to what the EPA, the DEC, and a lot of scientific people in the in Seacliff, in uh, Glenhead, in Glencoe are saying that they have written long, long scientifically based papers warning the governments about going ahead with this project. So I would like to ask you, if you can, to make sure that the EPA does not endanger the lives of the people who are going to whom they're trying to sell this property. And I have another person to comment on these garbage point issues. I know, Marsha. Do you want to comment on that? Uh, I, I think uh, that uh, Mr. Jakubiak covered it pretty well. And um, one thing that I would like to say is that unfortunately the financing is even worse or just as bad as the uh, environmental impacts. Um, but my question is really on a broader scale with um, the environment. And maybe you can cover both specific locally to Glen Cove and then more broadly. With the latest news of the Dakota Pipeline uh, resuming uh, construction and uh, continued fracking across a lot of the country, um, with our reliance on oil and coal and natural gas um, really as the predominantly predominant majority of our energy today, couple of questions. One is, as a minority party, the Democrats, how do we stop the wholesale destruction of our environment? You know, cutting down trees, developing these pipelines, they, they create leaks all over, there's something like 750 leaks in the last year, destroying our water systems. How do we, as the minority party, fight against this so that we have clean air, clean water, trees, uh, that we can survive, honestly? Um, and, and my understanding is, I mean, obviously there's a lot of money behind it. Um, and to look at our Secretary of State, there's a lot of money in oil and gas. Um, my, my question uh, on top of that is, my understanding is a lot of the oil that the Dakota Pipeline and the new pipeline um, through the mountains, um, a lot of that oil is actually going to be deported uh, or exported. Sorry, immigration. <laughs> it's, it's late. I'm going to a lot of uh, verbal slips here tonight. <laughs> it's going to be exported. And you mentioned earlier um, that we're a lot more self sufficient on our own energy. So I guess uh, a lot of questions wrapped up in here. But how do we, as a minority party, protect our environment? How do we uh, so build our reliance more on the renewables that was asked before so that we can? Uh, you know, divert from these, and then locally, uh, how do we ensure that our environment is safe, and safe to build on it? So they're actually, necessary. thank you both, they're actually the exact same answer, which is the whole theme that I've been trying to push tonight, which you have to organize as a race for mayor in Glen Cove this year, and for city council in Glen Cove this year. And you have to use the political process to educate people about what's going on. What's happened in Glen Cove is that there's been very little Glen Cove people, few Glen Cove people involved in the process of discussing the waterfront. I'm very intimately aware of everything with the waterfront. I didn't know about with this recent EPA statement that you were talking about, sir. But you know, 20 years ago, I was named a national model for cleaning up brownfield sites because we cleaned up a lot of the pollution on the waterfront at the Superfund sites and the hazardous waste sites for closing incinerators. And Al Gore actually presented an award to Glen Cove. It's like Chicago, Pittsburgh, Glen Cove. You know, about like fifty million dollars in the city of pollution. I was at the time, and for many years afterwards, specifically opposed to residential being built on the property for two reasons. Number one, I didn't want 
I didn't think it would be good financially for the city, and I wanted that the public to have access to the waterfront. And number two, I thought the standard of cleanup would be much higher for residential than for commercial, because you could have covered it with garages and things like that, and you could encapsulate the site. And that was changed by the subsequent mayor, and then the next mayor, who happened to be my cousin, and now the current mayor. Every one of them ran against the project for the waterfront, and each one ended up expanding what they ended up doing. So you have to just educate people about what, I wasn't aware that the EPA was saying there was a problem there. So if I'm not educated about it, then the public's not educated about it. I will help you to find out from the EPA exactly how they feel about what's going on there. Now if the EPA says it's, it's okay, then the EPA doesn't have an agenda. You know, they, 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 well, strike that. I don't, I don't, I don't mean that anymore. <laughs> so, so let's, you know, let's work on the politics in Glen Cove and use that as a vehicle by which to educate people. So same thing for nationally, you have to utilize the process to educate people about what the right thing and what the wrong thing is and try and get people on your team uh, in the process. So it's as, it's as simple as that. Regarding the head of the EPA, we've got to take advantage of the fact that the federal courts have recently ruled that he had to un show all of his emails that he had as Attorney General, and it, and it 6,000 emails, and it shows a lot of unseemly relationships that he has with the oil and gas industry. So, why would they wait the four days before they got him?